Okay, parasitology, parasites. You're going to learn how to describe characteristics, basically identify, okay? Principles of identification, lab methods for diagnosis. We're going to go through the stains, the different types of stains that are used in, in doing an open parasite. Okay, terminology. Parasitology, study of parasites and parasitism. Parasites is an organism. It lives within and at the expense of another organism. So it can live with another organism, either um, benefiting or not benefiting that uh, organism. But, um, so they can live together, but one can benefit or one can harm the other. And it's just a, a relationship between two living organisms. Parasitism is a state or condition of being infected or infested with parasites. And infection, invasion by or multiplication of microorganisms and body tissue resulting in disease. Remember this, these terminology, uh, terminology are good. Uh, it's a good way for me to make uh, an exam on like matching, okay, matching of terms. Infestation is the harboring of macroscopic parasites. An ectoparasite lives on the outer surface of the body. Uh, it's a type of infestation. That's an ectoparasite. Endoparasite lives within the body uh, of the host. The host is the, the individual being infected. A commensal parasite act actually derives benefit from the host without causing uh, any harm. It's kind of like, for example, sharp has those little sharks have those little fish um, swimming on them. It, uh, I think those the little fish kind of like feed off the the algae that grow on the on the skin of the sharks. The sharks don't care. They don't care, but it's a definite benefit to the little to the little fish. I forgot what they're called, but they they kind of like clean the, the the outer skin of the shark. So that organism benefits, and it doesn't harm or um, benefit well it benefits the shark but um it doesn't cause any harm to the shark so that's a parasitic that's a parasitic relationship okay cyst so you're going to know the difference between a cyst and a trope a cyst is a stage of an organism development which is resting okay it's non-modal cysts are non-modal okay and not capable of reproduction the non-modal part is important to know. Say, for example, that organism that you don't know what that is, but you can tell that it's non-modal because it doesn't have any pseudopods. So the way you can tell if an organism has, is, has no pseudopods is that for the most part, as a general rule of thumb, cysts are circular, okay? They're circular, just like this cell right here, this parasite. It's circular. So because it's circular, then it's not moving in any kind of direction. Had it been uh, uh, a trope, a trope is uh, the stage where it needs to move to where the food is. Okay, It needs to move to where it gets nutrition. So that's why a, uh, a trope is modal. And trophs are are usually not circular. So if you want to know the difference between a cyst and a troph, cysts are cysts are circular, and a troph is not circular. Okay, so uh, cyst is non-modal and a troph is modal. Troph. Okay, say for example, these are trophs. See how it's non-modal, and not. I mean, of course, it's non-modal. See how it's not circular. That means if it's not circular, it's a that's a trope. These are all tropes. They're not circular. So that means that they are modal. Okay. Trophozoa, state of an organism's development, which is modal, vegetative, and capable of reproduction. The cysts are not capable of reproduction, but the trope is. Okay. Non circular, therefore it's modal. Okay. The one just by take, taking a foot, you know, step back the one on the left it's almost a perfect circular circle so that's a cyst the one on the bottom it's not circular so that's a trope okay cyst versus trope okay incubation period is 
the uh, the period from initial exposure to the point which the parasites or the products can be demonstrated in feces. So it's the time from infection to the point where you can actually demonstrate it in feces. You do a stool sample. Uh, they take it to the laboratory for uh, ova and parasite exam. And then if you see parasites over, the ova are the eggs and the parasite is the actual parasite. If you see either ova, eggs, or parasite, then from the time of infection, from the time of initial exposure to the time that you see it microscopically, that's the incubation period, okay? When it's demonstrated in the feces, that's the end point, and the, the point of infection, that's the beginning point, okay? That's the incubation period. The host, like I mentioned earlier, that's the person or individual or organism that's being infected or infested by a parasite, okay? A host contains the parasite. And the, the parasite is obtains its nourishment from the host, okay? Just like I, taught, I mentioned the fish and the shark. So that fish is, um, you know, benefiting by eating the algae on the surface of the shark. So, and the shark doesn't care. The shark's not being, because it's not being harmed. So the host is, is the organism that harbors the parasite. Intermediate host is between the parasite and the final reservoir or the final, uh, final host, okay? And so in order to get to the host, it sometimes parasites need to go through um, other organisms like snails or fish. Okay, so an intermediate host is a required host in the parasitic life cycle in which essential larval development must occur before the parasite is infected to its definitive host. So the parasite, in order to get to its definitive or final host, it may need to uh, be, be facilitated by another organism, like either a snail or a fish, okay? Development occurs, but adulthood is not reached. It's not an adult until possibly it reaches the definitive or final host. Definitive host is any host harboring the adult or sexually mature stage of the parasite. So when, an, when a parasite is in transition, like if it's in the, um, when it goes through the immediate host on its way to the final definitive host, it's not in its mature life cycle, mature part of the life cycle. So by the time it gets to the definitive host, then that's when it turns into adulthood. Reservoir host is an animal that harbors a species of parasite that can be transmitted to and infect, infect man. So in a reservoir host is almost like, it's like a host, but it's not the real definitive host. It can be the final host, but if it moves on, it moves on to the definitive host. That's a reservoir. The reservoir host harbors the parasite and it's close to adulthood, okay? The definitive host is when the parasite is in the adult stage. Life cycle, I mentioned that before, it's a sequence of morphologic environmental stages necessary for survival and reproduction of parasites. So it's like the life cycle is like cradle to grave. When it's born, it goes through developmental stages. Um, it, um, like for example, you'll see in the malaria life cycle that uh, two points, there's two points in that malaria life cycle where mosquitoes will infect the, will infect the definitive host. So it goes through morphologic changes. It uh, creates gametes, uh, all gametes, or it can be recycled. There's meiosis and my mitosis going on. And um, that's why I require that you know, and I'm gonna teach you the malaria life cycle so you understand what happens, what kind of morphological changes take place um, when malaria infects a human, okay? There's three different stages, three different stages of the malaria life cycle that you will know. Vector is kind of like um, an inter vector is kind of like an intermediate host. Usually, vectors are kind of like arthropod vectors. A vector is an arthropod. An arthropod meaning like an insect. 
like tick, lice, mosquito. Okay, those are arthropods. Okay, a vector is an arthropod or other agent that carries microorganisms from one infected individual to another. So a vector uh, takes the disease from one individual and transmits it to um, infect another another uh, organism. Geographic distribution, okay. Factors affecting in endemicity, whether it's an endemic uh, disease, are three, the presence or, uh, and habits of suitable hosts, uh, easy escape in environmental conditions, presence or, and habits of a suitable host. So depending on uh, how the individual travels can determine whether or not that parasite's gonna uh, survive. If, it's, if it stays in one general area, then it's limited to that one general area. And it may not, and it may not propagate. Uh, easy escape if it's in a situation where uh, the environmental conditions may be harmful, may develop into a harmful situation. It needs to be able to escape from that situation and survive somewhere else. And environmental conditions, so things like the weather or the temperature, uh, if it gets too hot or too cold, the the organism needs to be able to trans. Uh, needs to be able to travel, okay? So mobility of the parasite is important for survival. Factors that affect the distribution of human parasites, economic conditions. I mean, if we if it's a third world country, then, then uh, hygiene may not be a priority. Uh, usually it's survival. Survival is the priority and hygiene becomes secondary. So economic conditions, social conditions, who, who these hosts like to hang out with, uh, religion, religious practices, you know, like uh, some religions don't, don't eat beef, some religions don't eat pork, uh, think, and, and it's because of religious region. And migration, the, like I mentioned on the previous slide, the ability of the parasite to migrate uh, adds to its survival. Distribution of human parasites, uh, a lot of parasites in the tropic and subtropic region, uh, temperate regions as well. So certain parasites uh, live in certain certain regions, depending on the temperature, uh, climate, desert, uh, or temperate regions. Factors involved in the transmission of parasites, the source of the infection, the mode of transmission, and the presence of susceptible hosts. So all of these factors are what parasites need and it helps in their survival, okay? The source of the infection, um, if, if the, the host is immunocompromised, then the parasite can easily infect that patient. The, the patient doesn't have any defense, defenses like, um, um, you know, uh, immune system. If the patient has a good immune system, then uh, the the host is able to fend off the parasites. The mode of transmission, if uh, the parasite is not able to go from individual to another individual, then that can affect the survival of the parasite. So these are the things that will help the parasite survive in the presence of a susceptible host. Susceptible host. Again, going back to whether or not the patient has a really good immune system or if it's immunocompromised. Okay, life cycles. There's three types of life, life cycles. No intermediate host where it goes from uh, human to human. One intermediate host, like maybe like a mosquito or two intermediate hosts like a crustacean and a fish uh, in that life cycle. So no intermediate hosts are transmitted from person to person. Um, Auto infection, contaminated food or drink, or fecal oral contamination. One intermediate host, uh, usually a large mammal, crustacean, or insect, like a, um, a mosquito or lice or a tick. Life cycle can vary from simple to complex. And then the two intermediate hosts, like, uh, like I mentioned, the first host can be a snail, and still the parasite is in its developmental stages. So during or when it's being transmitted via an in one intermediate or two intermediate hosts. Keep in mind that the parasite is not fully mature. It's not until it gets to 
the definitive host that the parasite is in its mature stage. So two intermediate hosts can be, uh, the first one can be a snail and the second one can be a fish. And here is a life cycle. I'm not gonna go completely into the life cycle, but it also illustrates um, uh, the types of hosts that are um, involved in the life cycle. So you got a cow, pig, and then you got fish. And then, um, see how how it gets infected then you got vegetation so the parasite gets the vegetation then it gets to like here that's called like a copepod then it the, it gets onto a fish because the fish eats the copepod and then the fish is eaten by the woman who fries it and gets infected and then here it's like you got a pig and host you have two hosts here you generate the eggs and again it it gets to the kitchen, and if you don't cook it well enough, then you can uh, infect people. The size of parasites um, can be as small as four to six microns by two to three microns. This type of uh, parasite here is Toxoplasma gondii, gondii, Toxoplasma gondii. You'll learn about that one. This is the one that's found in cats, uh, tricky cats, and I'll talk about that tricky story about cats, how they um, trick their prey into becoming victims for the cat. And the longest one is Diphilobothrium latum. You know that one from he hematology, D latum. This is the, the tapeworm, all right? D latum, Diphilobothrium latum. Uh, the largest egg, Bacillopsis buski, that's a fluke, Bacillopsis species. And uh, portal, portals of entry by mouth, by ingestion. Usually it's by ingestion. That's one way that gets into your body. Another one is inhalation, uh, airborne, airborne, airborne ova, like the pinworm, uh, can be inhaled. Uh, and entry into the skin or break into the skin. Um, direct contact, intermediate form penetrates the skin. And those are like hookworms, that's a Nicotor americanus. You, you see the, um, um, on the scolex, this is the head, which is the scolex. And you see, this is what the organism bites or attaches onto your body. And these are the eggs of that parasite. You're gonna, you're gonna know this when I, we get into the, the slides. So entry into the skin or break in the skin. Portal of entry, sexual contact, like Trichomonas, Vaginalis um, can be transmitted uh, through sexual contact. Transplacental, where the mother can pass it on to the baby in the placenta. Again, this is Toxoplasma gondii. Okay, preparation and examination procedures. Preparation and examination procedures. Good hygiene percent. Uh, prevents paras uh, infection by parasites. Hand washing, protective clothing, PPE. That's why in the laboratory we wear PPE and a work area cleaning. Make sure that when you're done, you disinfect your benches before and after using them. So those are good lab practices. Ha wash your hands, PPE, and keeping your area clean. Uh, lab safety, chemicals and solvents. A lot of them in, when working with parasites contain uh, chemicals that are harmful harmful to you. Like for example, mercury was eliminated and that was a really good fixative uh, when processing when processing stool. But unfortunately, because of the harmful effects of mercury, they took it out of the processing materials and we have to use substitutes. But uh, unfortunately, when um, mercury was part of the processing materials, they got really, really beautiful trichrome stains and it was really easy to see the parasites, but the substitutes are not uh, as good quality as mercury was, okay? So when you're using these chemicals because they're solvent and, and they're volatile and you don't wanna breathe the fumes, it's always good practice to work underneath the safety hood. And you always wanna use chemicals in accordance with, that's what IAW means, IAW means in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. So you always want to follow manufacturer's instructions. 
that's the rule. When an inspector comes to your laboratory and it sees how you're processing certain things, could be blood, could be stool, could be anything in the microbiology lab, he's going to watch how you process those, those uh, specimens. And then what he'll do is he'll go to the SOP and make sure that you follow the SOP to the letter, okay? Because if you don't, then that's, that's a violation. Mercury chloride, that's what I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is not used anymore because it, mercury chloride contains mercury. Formalin is used as a, uh, another chemical that's used as a preservative. Chemical and solv solvent disposal, you, need, you can't just, I know in, in the, our laboratory, just stains alone, we can't dump it down the drain. To me, it's like, why do we have sinks if we can't use the sinks? You know what I mean? So, no, we have to dump it into that big barrel, and that big barrel will dispose of the stains and chemicals um, somewhere else, but it, we can't just dump it down the drain. So, disposal of chemicals in accordance with manufacturer and command instructions. So, this lecture was um, uh, originally in the Navy, so a command is, is a major facility. That's what we call uh, the command. It's like a, a hospital is a command. It's Navy talk, so ignore that. Flammables. Use lab SOP for guidance. Examples, flammable chemicals include ethyl alcohol, xylene and toluene, but xylene and toluene aren't used uh, too much anymore, if at all, because xylene contains benzene, has the benzene ring. Anything that has a benzene ring in it, like xylene and toluene, those are carcinogens, so they've essentially been eliminated from the laboratory, but they're dangerous chemicals. Equipment safety, use PPE when operating laboratory equipment. Standard rule, rule of thumb for laboratory safety. You always have to use your PPE. Centrifuges, use them in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Glassware, use standard precautions to prevent glass or breakage. A lot of glass has been taken out of the laboratory because, because of breakage and uh, causing injuries. So, and then uh, glass needs to be disposed of uh, properly. You don't want to dispose of glass in regular trash. They have to go to the sharps container. Uh, heating elements and equipment. That's why I don't like to use um, those incin loop incinerators where you stick it in and it turns orange and then you wave it so it, the, your loop cools off. I like to use the disposable loop, you know, uh, streak with one side, turn it over, then you have another clean side and streak for isolation. I like the disposable loops. Those heating elements, if you use them, like those loop incinerators, have to be used in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Uh, observe burn prevention measure, like don't keep it too long, or where you're going to cre actually create a flame. Specimen collection, uh, patient identification is really important. You don't want to mix and match the wrong patient with the wrong specimen. The containers need to be wide mouth, plastic, and direct collection. So those are different types of stool collection that are placed on the toilet uh, so that you can get a stool sample. Fecal specimen handling. Okay, lovely topic. Specimens should be handled carefully due to possibility of contamination, and they should be submitted to the testing department immediately. As with all other specimens, you don't want to collect a, a specimen like a urine or a CSF and, you know, at the nurse's station and then put it on the counter and then wait a couple hours later or, or say, well, I'm going to pass the laboratory on my way out when I go home. You need to... As soon as the specimen is collected, it needs to be transported to the laboratory as soon as possible. ONP or open parasite exams, uh, you want to do it before x-ray procedures because they uh, usually give you things like barium enema, which will kill the parasites. You want to know if there's uh, living parasites in your body. So it's just like uh, if you want to find out what bacteria is causing an infection, you want to collect a sample, like a urine sample or a wound sample or whatever, the blood culture. You want to collect it before the patient's given antibiotics, okay? 
Uh, barium enema in testosterone protozoa will be undetectable for at least one week after barium enema. Okay. Uh, the stool becomes chalky. That's that's what that is. It becomes chalky and it becomes an interfering substance. ONP exam should be delayed one week following medication. So if the patient is taking medication or antibiotic, you need to wait a week. Antibiotics, uh, if the patient is taking mineral oil, bismuth derivatives, or anti-malarial medication, you have to take a week before you collect another specimen. Interfering substances like antiseptics, laxatives, soap, urine, and water. These types of things will uh, get into or um, be an interfering substance uh, while you are examining a stool specimen or a trichrome specimen because you'll see a lot of this stuff, either an antiseptic or a laxative or soap, urine, and water. Okay, Those are interfering substances. Intestinal parasite specimen collection, you want to collect three specimens uh, in an, over a two or three day interval. So if you want to catch uh, intestinal parasites, collect three specimens, usually stool samples, in a two or three day interval at the same time of day. Amoeba biases, amoeba biases specimen collection. Usually it's six specimens over a 10 day period, one day apart. Specimen submission must be submitted immediately. Don't collect it, set it on the counter and say, well, I'll drop it off at the lab uh, on my way out. No, once you collect it, you need to take the time to deliver it to the lab as soon as possible. We'll either refrigerate it, which is not optimal, or we'll plant it and um, do our setups off the, off the sample right away. The modal forms of parasites will die after 30 minutes and preserved within 30 minutes after, and uh, the specimen must be preserved within 30 minutes after collection. And no, that's a collection of the, the preservatives for stool. PVA or polyvinyl alcohol, that's a preservative. Advantages, it, it's the per, pres, preservation of preservative of choice. The preservative of choice for stool uh, on using PVA is uh, PVA, okay? It's a, the preservative of choice. You can make permanent permanent slides. Uh, formula concentrations can be drawn from PVA preserved specimens and it's stable for up to a year. The disadvantages of PVA is that it contains mercury. So you don't, you don't use PVA too much anymore. And it's a possible disposal hazard. Shot ends preservative fixative, okay? That's, um, they don't use it anymore uh, because of the mercury. Advantage, uh, it's good, great for fresh stools. Permanent slides can be made uh, and adapted to inpatients. This advantage is because it's not used anymore, it's because it contains mercury, mercury chloride. Formalin preservative, uh, formalin still being used in the laboratory. Advantages, uh, used in 10% concentration. Heat solution to and uses a heat solution to disinfect. Disadvantages are you cannot use for permanent slides. Methylate iodine formalin, MIF. Methylate iodine formalin. Well, methylate contains mercury, so this is not used very much anymore. So you get the point. We don't want to use preservatives that contain mercury. All right. And usually the result of using mercury in your processing and preparation is that you get great looking results, okay? The advantages of iodine and methylate, uh, iodine and methylate formaldehyde has preserving capabilities. Those are the advantages of using methylate iodine formaldehyde. formaldehyde. Disadvantage, again, uh, the big disadvantage is that it contains mercury. It can't be used for permanent slide, and it's not adapted for concentration procedures. And there's that mercury. And now I'm supposed to stop, but you know what? I think I'm on a pretty good roll, so I'm going to continue. Stool concentration technique is done on all fecal specimens. Uh, the concentration technique is also ensures detection of even small numbers of organisms. Usually, it's a conical-shaped tube. Uh, 
of stool that's suspended. And then um, what you do is you centrifuge it until you get a button at the end of the cone, the conical tube. And that's what you use to uh, look for your parasites. So uh, centrifugation uh, will concentrate the parasites. The flotation technique is based on specific gravity, okay? The zinc sulfate uh, flotation technique, it includes sugar and sodium chloride. So this is a qualitative test for the detection of nematode and cestode eggs, okay? And again, separation is based on different uh, specific gravities. Advantages of the zinc sulfate procedure is a high specific gravity, free of debris, and you get eggs and cysts float to the surface, and it detects protozoan cysts and nematode ova. All other advantages of the zinc sulfate is that it's better sedimentation for concentrating cysts in the eggs, except for a percolated ova. Uh, a percolated means it has a lid. It has a lid, like it, it can open up and close, okay? It, it has a lid. Uh, schistosomal ova, ova and infertile characteristic eggs, because these are all are percolated. Like I said, percolated, um, opercolated means it, it has a lid. When it opens up the lid, then fluid gets in, and then so much for the procedure of uh, zinc flotation separation based on specific gravity. Because they're all percolated, then uh, fluid gets into the parasite, and then you don't have separation based on specific gravity. And the zinc sulfate uh, procedure is used on fresh specimens. You always want to use a fresh type specimen. Disadvantage of the zinc flotation uh, procedure is that it destroys the tropes. The walls of the eggs and cysts collapse. Uh, it's not for trematode and cestode egg. Uh, the organism, the organisms become distorted in appearance, and rapid deceleration may cause the floating uh, organisms to sink to the bottom. So there's flaws in the concentration procedure portion of processing um, because deceleration may cause the floating organisms to sink to the bottom. Formalin ethyl acetate, formula. Formalin ethyl acetate is a technique of choice for sedimentation. It's the easiest, has the least number of errors, and recovers protozoa, ova, and paras, ova, and larva. And it can add iodine for staining, fresh or preserved specimens. Okay, the formalin ethyl acetate procedure is less effective than the flotation for system tropes. It, it, in other words, it has poor recovery less than the flotation for cysts and tropes. Preservatives, uh, most, uh, most parasites include schistosomes and operculated ova. Okay, and um, this procedure is safer than formalin ether technique. Okay. Uh, sedimentation technique, formalin ether, same advantages as previous, rapid procedure, removes the liquid and colloidal material. Ether is highly flammable and explosive. That's a hazard. Specimen examination. Well, I've examined your stool sample, Mrs. Newton, and a okay, little humor from the previous instructor. Um, that's okay. Macroscopic examination. That's where you take your, your um, specimen is set it in front of you, and then you describe it. Is it hard or formed? Okay, is it hard or formed, as opposed to soft and liquid, okay? Stools can either be hard or formed, or soft and liquidy, okay? Loose, watery, liquid, liquid stools, those types of specimens usually contain tropes. So if you wanna look for the tropes, remember the tropes are not the ones that are circular, okay? Note. Helminth, oven, and larva are found in any fecal consistency. Color, okay, so when you get your stool sample, you're gonna be, depending on your laboratory, what they wanna do is that they wanna document the, the severity of the loam. Okay, so uh, color, occult blood, dark stool, bright red, 
blood and mu blood and mucus, yellow and fulminating ganglia, uh, giardia lamblia, giardia lamblia. Okay, proglottids. Each section in a worm like that, like a tapeworm, each section that contains the uterus is called a proglottid. So, uh, so right there, it looks like. <laughs> Excuse me, it looks like a bamboo stick, but each compartment is actually a proglottid containing its own reproductive materials uh, and organs. Proglottids may be found at the bottom of the container. Pinworm ova may be found at the surface of the specimen. If mucus is present, check for possible tro trophozoites. Macroscopic examination again, examined within 30 minutes, uh, quick processing. A uh, soft specimen should be labeled within one hour, um, be probably because uh, since it's since it's soft, then uh, it uh, it'll be easier to process because the longer you wait, then it'll it'll turn hard and be difficult to um, handle. Charcoal-laden crystals, you remember that from hematology. Charcoal-laden crystals are crystals that came from eosinophils, okay, associated with amoebiasis and helminth infections, and it's derived from eosinophilic granules. Okay. Scan the entire slide wet mounts for 30 minutes on low power. So there's unlike the AFB, there's no minimum number of fields that you need to be looking at. Wet mounts, uh, direct wet mounts is the same thing prep for motility. Iodine prep, iodine prep is used for cysts and kills tropes. A super, super vital stains for tropes. A super vital stain by definition is a stain that will uh, be taken up by uh, an organism, a living organism, okay? <clears throat> Permanent slide stains is a reliable method performed in conjunction with concentration procedure. And uh, the permanent slide stain is recommended for every fecal specimen. Every, everybody gets a memorand um, uh, a, a record of collection. Permanent slide stains, uh, you have uh, color contrast between organisms and background material for easy identification. So with these permanent slide stains, you can see morphology under oil immersion. You can see items overlooked in wet mounts can be more readily found on uh, the permanent slide. And it's more convenient and it's permanent. Okay, permanent slide stains for, is used for consultation, performed only on fresh specimens. You all remember, process these right away. Don't wait too long. PVA, PVA or Schadens preserved specimens, again, probably not used because they contain mercury, and it's not for formalin or MIF preserved feces. <clears throat> trichrome stain, that's the stain for parasites. Trichrome or Gamoy stain. It's rapid, easy to use, highly stable, and it can be used repeatedly, and, and it's consistent. Uh, types of stain trichrome. Uh, in this type of stain, the cytoplasm stains blue-green, tinged with purple. The nucleus is red to reddish purple, and the background material is green to green-blue. Nice, pretty colors. So here you see two, two uh, cysts. Cysts because it's circular and left and right, okay? Permanent slide stains, uh, Heidenhain's iron hematoxin stain. It's a little bit more complex, um, probably the, in the timing of the, the components of the stain. Uh, it's time consuming and it requires experienced technicians or technologists to process uh, using the Heidenhain's iron hematoxin stain. The Spencer Monroe, it's easier to use. Background is blue gray, nucleus blue black, purplish blue, and the cytoplasm is lighter than the nucleus. Pseudoparasites, okay? Pseudoparasites resemble 
a parasite, but it's not a parasite, okay? Resembles a parasite, but not a parasite. Therefore, you get false identification. And some of these pseudoparasites can be as simple as WBCs, epithelial cells, pollen grains, uh, nice geometric shape with a pollen grain, and uh, hopefully we can let them fly it. Uh, fly it. Um, no, excuse me. Pollen grains. Pollen grains come from plants and they are geometric. Pollen grains are geometric and uh, can be confused with um, with ova, but they they are either hexagonal and um, they have nice even sides. So pollen grains can be confused sometimes as ova. Plant structures like um, um, parts of the plants, fibers especially. Some some fibers and plants can be confused with with parasites. And yeast, I know we just finished mycology. Some yeast can be confused with, um, because of the shapes. Yeast are egg-shaped. Some of the, a lot of the eggs are egg-shaped, okay? So yeast can also be confused with parasites. Malarial smears, uh, I think we'll, hopefully we'll get, take a look at some malarial smears where you can see ring forms, but we'll see, definitely see Malaria on uh, the cortical, uh, not cortical, but the PowerPoint slides. Uh, that's where we'll see the malaria smears. Platelets. Platelets are pseudoparasites. Uh, they stain purple and fuzzy, and they can be confused with small parasites. Uh, correct staining technique and proper focusing. The flotation technique, like the zinc sulfate flotation technique, like I mentioned earlier, concentrates the cysts and eggs based on specific gravity, okay? So if it's heavy, a heavy in specific gravity, then it'll tend to be on the lower portion of the conical tube, or if it's uh, lighter in specific gravity, then those are the parasites that will float to the top of the tube. So that's why it's called the zinc sulfate flotation technique. Uh, the reagents, those are the reagents. I'm gonna, uh, in future lectures, you don't need to know what the reagents are because you won't be processing them um, reagents and equipment procedure is how to process these stool samples. Unless you're in a laboratory that will process oven parasites, um, I'm not going to make you study or memorize these procedures. Okay. Um, a lot of reagents and chemicals, and then you do centrifugation. And again, all you need to know is that the zinc sulfate flotation technique is the separation, you have separation based on specific gravity. Okay, so once you get your sediment, place it on your slide, make a smear, and then you do your trichrome stain. QC, specific gravity of different, um, um, use materials of different specific gravity, and that's your, that's your QC, 1.180 to 1.200. The sedimentation technique is another technique where you have uh, concentration uh, based, the heavier protozoan cysts and eggs are concentrated uh, because of its natural weight. There's uh, reagents again. Uh, I'm not going to make you memorize the reagents of this procedure. Uh, pipettes, applicator sticks, glass slide gauze, uh, stool, Mix it up, let it stand for half an hour, and then you use centrifuge it. For loose water stools, you use five to six mLs of material. <clears throat> Once after you centrifuge and take the material that you sent that sediments or at the bottom of the cone, and that's where you make your uh, that's where you make your smear, and then you do a trichrome stain. <clears throat> All right, more um, procedural information, which I'm not going to, there's, there's your end at the bottom of the conical tube. That's a sedimentation technique. Okay, loose plug, decant tube, uh, discard, discard the top three layers. All you want is the bottom portion of that tube. QC, formalin ethyl acetate, check formalin for proper pH. <clears throat> formalin preservative, that's another one. Prevents the specimen from deteriorating. Uh, a lot of the stools, because it's been sitting around, will have a tendency to deteriorate, but formalin will make it, will help it maintain its 
uh, shape and form. Reagents for the formula procedure, uh, procedure, one part feces to formalin, QC, color, color contrast. That's a trichrome Gamori stain. Color, it's it's a nice, I don't know if we're gonna be able to look at trichrome stains. When you do open parasites, it's almost like AFB stains. You're searching, you're searching, you're searching, and then you start to see things like, remember I mentioned the artifacts like the plant fibers and, and the spores that have geometric shapes and the yeast the old world yeeps, yeast. So you'll see all these um, pseudo parasites, but the color contrast will help define what's a true parasite or not. Okay, and that's why I like the, the trichrome uh, Gamori stain, the trichrome stain. More reagents, uh, reagents again, reagents again, uh, Dantoni iodine solution. Uh, that's a, that's a, a common, re unique reagent. And xylene and toluene will not be used because they are carcinogenic. And here's more procedure stuff. Okay, QC. Always want to use positive and negative control. All right. So I got through all that staining and processing and stuff that you really, really didn't need to know. That's why. Um, for next semester, I'm going to eliminate those um, those slides because I still want to focus. Again, my focus is to make sure I teach you guys what you will probably be seeing on your ASCP exam. So now we're going to get into the parasites, the protozoans. Protozoa is uh, it's pro, let's pro term eukaryotic single cell animals, usually microscopic such as amoebas, ciliates, and flagellates and sporozoans, both uh, parasites based on their mode of transport, uh, mode of transportation, mode, mode of mobility, okay? A eukaryote is, has a membrane-bound nucleus, okay? That term was in mycology. Trophozoa, you know, remember, it's the modal form, the asexual form of certain protozoa. Just remember, a troph is the one that's not circular, it's modal. But it's uh, it's an asexual form of certain protozoa, modal, and it's a vegetative. The cyst, remember, that's the one that's circuit, circular, circular, capsule-like sac containing certain protozoa at their dormant or larval stage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, chromatin chromatoidal bodies is part of the nucleus. It has genetic material inside the cell. <clears throat> cytotoxic is anything that will kill certain cells, like a certain chemicals or are cytotoxic to certain parasites. Okay. Something is anything that produces a toxic effect on certain cells. A karyosome is an aggregation of chromatin in the nucleus. A phagocyte, you know what a phagocyte is uh, from hematology, it engulfs material. So a cell that engulfs and absorbs other cells or foreign materials in the bloodstream or tissues. Pleomorphic. Pleomorphic is a term that um, in microbiology, it's different shapes. It's the same organism, but it has different shapes. Occurrence of two or more structural forms of a specific organism during a life cycle. For example, if you remember things like Haemophilus, it's cockabacilli. So it could either be a short or stubby cockabacillus, or it can be a long cockabacillus. It's the same organism, but it has different shapes. You know, it's the, uh, so that's what pleomorphic means. Commenso, I think I defined commenso as characterized by a symbiotic relationship between two organisms where one benefits from the host, but and the host doesn't is not harmed at all. One benefits and the other's not harmed. That's a commensal relationship. I'm not going to get into taxonomy. Okay, the amoebas. Sarcodina, okay, class amoeba. Consists of single cell, metabolism. Going over, I'm going to go over metabolism, reproduction. Uh, it lacks a, thick, lacks a thick cell membrane, and it has pseudopods. Remember, pseudopods are um, It's uh, for the trope. That's its mode of mobility, okay? It gets from one place to another. 
see all these these kind of spiky things those are pseudopods okay there's a contractile vacuole there's a nucleus and there's food vacuous but this is a, a typical it's it's not going to be like that that looks like a, a splatter but the pseudopods pseudopods means that it's modal it's going to move to where the food is e histolytica it's the first parasite Entamoeba histolytica. This is a bad guy. Okay. Entamoeba histolytica can cause uh, um, really bad diarrhea and it can be invasive. And, and one of the ways that you can tell that it's invasive or it's a bad guy is that it can ingest RBCs. So if it's ingesting RBCs, those are red blood cells that you need and it doesn't need to be in a parasite. So E. histolytica is um is an important parasite histo it means related to organic tissue and lytic means it's lice or destroy the cysts uh okay infection of infection of mature cysts remember the cysts are circular the cyst will insist releasing metasis metasis will turn into a trope so that's the development first the cyst will release uh in its life cycle, release metasis, which will turn into a trope. Okay, it goes from cyst to trope. All right. Trophozoids, remember, those are the ones with the pseudopods. Those are the ones that migrate. So for E. histolytica, they will migrate to the large intestine, and that's where it'll multiply and enter the bloodstream. So remember, one of the characteristics of E. histolytica is that it contains red blood cells. If you see a cyst, a round cyst, one nucleus with red blood cells, then it's probably going to be E. histolytica. Once it's in the bloodstream, then it'll invade uh, three major organs, the liver, brain, and the lungs. Both the tropes and the cysts are passed down in the feces. Okay, so stool samples, that's where you do your open parasite and you look for Entamoeba histolytica cysts and tropes. And there's the life cycle of E. histolytica. I'm not going to read that to you, but you can tell um, how, how humans can be infected and what organs that uh, E. histolytica will infect. Pathogenicity um, E. histolytica will cause amoebic dysentery or amoebiasis. Uh, you'll see charcoal-laden crystals. Remember, if you have a parasitic infection because of the eosinophilic granules, you'll see charcoal-laden crystals. They, lo they look like really long spears or spiky things, okay? And these are remnants of eosinophils. And charcoal-laden crystals are due to the organism's ability to destroy WBCs by the use of cytotoxin. So when the WBC is destroyed, what's left over are the eosinophilic granules, okay? And those eosinophilic granules will accumulate in the form of charcoalatum crystals. <clears throat> Pathogenicity, proyolytic lysosomal enzymes, uh, it's invasive, okay? So what'll happen is it will erode the intestinal wall. Like I said, this organism, this parasite will invade your intestine and get into your bloodstream. This is not a good parasite. It gains entrance into the bloodstream and other organs, okay, and cause abscesses of the liver, lung, and brain, okay? Remember, E. histolytica. And there's portions of the uh, intestine. Non-invasive pathogenicity uh, remains confined. If the organism can remain to the remain confined to the intestinal intestinal lumen and it will not penetrate the intestinal wall intestinal wall and get into your bloodstream so though that form of that parasite will not be invasive and infect the brain liver and uh what is it the brain liver and um you know the third organ and it's still, you still may pass the cyst in the soul because it, you're still you're still in the intestine so you can still identify that parasite uh, through ONP, open parasite exam of stool. The nucleus of E. histolytica is delicate, even peripheral granule, granules 
along the periphery of the nuclear membrane. You're not going to see the nucleus that close that you can see chromatin granules with a small centrally located karyosome. Uh, a karyosome is kind of like a nucleoli, but a karyosome is part of the nucleus. Okay, that is E. histolytica, and as you can see, this is not a cyst, it's not circular, so this is a trope. So make get used to knowing the difference between a cyst and a trope. It's not circular, so this must be a trope. E. histolytica has one nucleus, okay? So this is E. histolytica, entamoeba histolytica. You're going to see these on the parasite slides, and then you'll be expected to identify these. You're not going to have the name like entamoeba histolytica on the slide. You'll just have to know and identify that, identify it. For the tropes, uh, 20 to 30 microns, nucleus, only one. For E. histolytica, e histolytica it's only one nucleus. Just like that, one nucleus. That's it right there. It looks like an eye. Okay, inclusions. If any, usually it's RBCs, and that's diagnostic. If you see red blood cells, it's E. histolytica. If you see one nucleus, that confirms E. histolytica. Okay, cytoplasm to clean and find the granular. There's motility, especially for the trope. Remember, the trope is the one that's modal. E. histolytica, one nucleus. Uh, and not circular. RBCs in the upper upper right, those are red blood cells. I can't see the nucleus, but because I can't see the nucleus, but because I see the red blood cells, it's probably E. histolytica. And because it's not circular, it's a heat E. histolytica trope. Okay. The one here, uh, the one at the bottom, it's almost circular. I see one nucleus. I don't see any red blood cells. So this is E. histolytica cyst with no red blood cells. And so this would be a cyst. The one on the left would be a trope. Okay, E. histolytica trope versus cyst. The one on the left are tropes because they're not circular. One nucleus, the one on the right is circular. And those are probably red blood cells or chromatoidal bodies, okay? One nucleus. So E. histolytica, trope on the left and cyst on the right. So the cyst, uh, 10 to 15 microns, nuclei can be one to four, but usually it's one. Inclusions are the chromatoidal bodies, which are aggregate of ribosomes, and the, the cyst can also contain glycogen vacuoles. So there's, stuff within the e-histolytica cyst that can be confusing but still one main nucleus but it can be one to four but usually it's just one okay cyst e histo e entamoeba histolytica cyst when i go through the slides um i'll use only the the images that uh, i will be testing you on oh my goodness okay so that's it. That's it for parasitology one. So I'm going to be giving you the parasitology slides that you need to know, and then we'll review them and we will review them again and we'll review them, review them several times so that you really, really know them. Are there any questions? I know this is a different language from bacteria, a different language from mycology and AFB. So now we're into the parasites, which is a pretty large section. So fortunately, I did both sections of Parasitology 1. I'll do the review in Mycology tomorrow and no lecture schedule on Friday, which I originally scheduled because I did Parasitology 1. Are there any questions? Because I'm going to start doing the review of the Parasitology slides and you'll see what I'm talking about. And once I do the review, it'll be easy to memorize because when I review with you guys, then um, you seem to be be picking up pretty good. Any questions? Of course not. All right. If there aren't any questions, so tomorrow in laboratory, <clears throat> first thing in the laboratory, I'm going to tell Daniela to pull out the, remember the frozen serum? The frozen serum, I'm going to have her pull it out so it's going to be thawed by the time you get there. 
and then we'll take Canada Albicans, make a suspension. The first thing I want you to do is make a suspension in that 0 0.5 ml aliquot of serum and uh, incubate it um, at the beginning of class tomorrow. We'll do the review. And uh, you'll also do bioleskinin on listeria so that you can, you can believe that listeria looks like strep with a bioleskinin positive. And then we'll finish off listeria. And then we'll try to do the, um, oh, okay. Then we'll take your listeria out of the um, refrigerator and then you'll incubate that one plate of listeria in your drawer and, and keep it at room temperature. So, um, so that on Friday, what your lab will be is to do the hanging, hanging drop. And hopefully you'll see listeria doing tumbling motility because tumbling motility is, um, that's how you get uh, listeria to tumble. It has to be at room temperature. All right, so that's tomorrow's lab and Friday's lab. We'll do the review on um, tomorrow and then you'll have your mycology test on Friday and we'll do hanging drop on Friday. All right, any questions? Okay, if not, then I will see you tomorrow at four. Have a good night. Okay, you too. Have a good evening.